Hi there, everyone. I trust that you're enjoying this series as much as I am. Today, we're going to be talking about acceptance. Acceptance. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. We want to activate authentic community and we ask for your help. May you help us, Lord God, as we embrace these key activators for authentic community. We ask that, Holy Spirit, you would come and dig deep where no one else can reach. Come and liberate us and grant us freedom so that we may truly bond and connect with each other. We open our hearts to you now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. <clears throat> you know, in an authentic community, people feel accepted for who they are. And that's why I want to talk about acceptance. They don't need to pretend or to project an ideal image in order to belong. In order for this to take place, three things need to happen. Firstly, we have to deal with the spirit of rejection. We have to deal with the spirit of rejection. Secondly, embracing self-acceptance. We have to embrace self-acceptance. And thirdly, we have to learn to accept others for who they are. And in this particular sermon, I want to deal with the first dimension, and that's really to do with dealing with the spirit of rejection. And then in subsequent sermons, we'll talk about self-acceptance. We will then talk about how to accept other people. I believe that God is so good and he's so faithful, and he really wants to bring freedom to us in these areas. So how do we deal with rejection? Let's just talk about that a little bit. You know, the enemy's strategy against us, against you, against me, is to actually wound us with rejection and with abandonment. And when this happens, we then compensate through fleshly patterns that we embrace, okay? And these fleshly patterns and strongholds can actually open us up to demonic activity. You see, a wounded person is a hurting person, and hurt people hurt others. A lot of the wounding that takes place, takes place when we're still young and we have all been wounded and wounding is very subtle, isn't it? Especially these wounds that come from rejection and abandonment. You know, sometimes it can be intentional, but a lot of times it's unintentional. Now, thing about physical wounds is you can bandage them up immediately. But when it comes to emotional wounds, we try to do something else about them, don't we? Remember, pain seeks pleasure. Pain seeks pleasure. And sometimes when you experience the pain associated with rejection, you can, you can actually go out looking for illicit pleasure, right? And that actually ends up messing up this authentic biblical-based community that we're trying to create. You see, wounded Christians will run to counterfeits right? When they develop a wound of rejection, they will run to counterfeits. And very often that counterfeit becomes a stronghold in our minds. Now, the thing is, if you have a tree that you plant, but you decide you want to uproot it, it's better to do so when it's just eight inches high, right? Just eight inches high than when it's three meters or eight meters, right? You see, at eight inches, the root system is only about eight, eight inches deep, right? But at three meters, the root system tends to be about three meters deep. So we need to pray for our children before the root system is so deep and more difficult to uproot. And I want to talk about dealing with rejection today because for many of us, our wounds are so deep, our wounding of rejection, and it's actually causing us to struggle when it comes to bonding and forming authentic community. You see, wounds become strongholds, and strongholds attract demonic spirits. You see, a stronghold is a belief pattern that exalts itself above the knowledge of Christ. The strongholds in our minds determine how we respond to situations. And we are failing to come to a place in the body of Christ of authentic community because of the spirit of rejection and the lies that it comes with. Let's be honest. You see, and this is because a stronghold will include default reactions and defense mechanisms that end up preserving a particular pattern of behavior. A spirit of rejection multiplies those feelings of rejection 
and the lies and the irrational behavior associated with them. Now, how many of you have experienced crowded loneliness? This is where you've got people you're in relationship with, but you still feel lonely. I remember many years ago when I was in a prayer meeting in my varsity days in the 90s, and the pastor was very prophetic, said to me that, Paul, I believe that you have believed a demonically inspired lie that is saying to you, you will always be looking from the outside in. And I remember identifying with it. And that's a wound of rejection, isn't it? That sense of, I'll always be looking from the outside in. I'll always be an outsider. I'll never be an insider. And I still remember when this pastor invited me uh, to a time away, a trip away with a couple of friends of mine. And I remember I was very quick to say, okay, you guys are going. And I wanted to join them, but there was a thing in me, oh, I need to study. And so sometimes what happens is when we believe these lies and we embrace these strongholds, we end up rejecting ourselves before we can be rejected. And that's how this wound of rejection sometimes works in our lives. If you have a wound of rejection in your life, you'll project it onto others, won't you? You know those people who pitch up at church and they're always accusing other people, saying, this church hasn't got friendly people. The people are unfriendly. But the real issue is you don't feel like you can be a friend. You don't feel loved. You feel like you're unlovable. And so you project that. In other words, your external world has to adjust to your internal reality. And your internal reality is skewed by cognitive distortions that are filled up in your heart and in your mind, you see. So I believe that God wants to heal us concerning some of these things, you see. Because what happens is that we are then more likely to engage in counterfeits in order to deal with our pain when we're bound by rejection. But you know that God designed family and community partly so that children build up emotional object constancy. That's that deep sense of I am loved, I am cared for, even when you're not currently being told that. But because it was reinforced to you so often and so consistently, you've internalized it. It's called emotional object constancy. Right? And it's through the love, it's through the acceptance, it's through the affection that they receive, these children receive from parents and from loved ones all around them. And I believe that authentic community in the church today is often a reparenting process where we learn to celebrate the people around us. You see, and I'm telling you now, when this is not fully present, there will be holes. There will be holes in your soul, holes in our souls that produce negative fruit. Now you can decide for yourself, what type of fruit do I want in my life? And it's so important for us to really be honest about how we've been wounded. It's all right to be weak, to be vulnerable. It doesn't mean uh, you don't love your parents or your siblings or whoever might have rejected you. You're just facing reality saying, this is what I experienced. Now, whether they sinned against you knowingly or unknowingly, it still impacted you. It still impacted you. And this process that I'm going to take you through is going to help you to ultimately forgive. And next time when I preach on this, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the process of healing uh, from rejection. And as you feel the pain, give it over to God. Give it over to God. You see, it is through these wounds that darkness enters it's through these wounds that darkness enters. So don't be in denial. And what was a wound of rejection can very often become a spirit of rejection. I love what uh, David Lege said. He said, you cannot repent of a demon. Repentance will not be enough to deal with demonic force. Neither can you repent of a wound. A demon has to be cast out and a wound must be healed. And you see, stage one is the wound, the wounding that you experience. Stage two is a stronghold then developing. And stage three is a demonic spirit of rejection. And we don't want to get there. But for some of you, that's what you need, deliverance from that demonic spirit of rejection. And often it's associated with a lying spirit that lies to you concerning the people around you, that they hate you. And you get into what we call the persecutory superego, where you think the whole world is against you. Now, here's what I want to say to you. God's acceptance of you is bigger than your rejection. 
It's so important to understand that God's acceptance of you is bigger than your rejection. In the book of Psalms 27 verse 10, the Bible says, When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Isn't that so powerful? I don't know what type of rejection you faced, but when my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Do you know that when Samuel came to anoint the king, David was not even on the selection list. That's the level of rejection. Imagine you're in a situation where a great prophet comes and he's looking for a potential king and your dad doesn't even put you on the list. Imagine he's saying, where are your sons? Where are your sons? And he's literally forgotten about you, doesn't include you. Imagine the depth of rejection that you will experience. You see, this would have brought rejection into his life. And we should remember that there's always a way out despite all the pain that we've been through. You see, God should always be our source. And sometimes he takes us through tests. He takes us through a journey that helps us to go back to him and say, Lord, I can be rejected by other people, but I'm not going to look for validation from them. I'm going to look for it from you. You see, don't go to the counterfeits, but make him your stronghold. Are you prepared to run to God? In the book of Romans chapter 15, verse 7, it says, Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. And in subsequent sermons, we're going to go deeper into the acceptance of others. But that's an instruction in the book of Romans. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. I've been accepted by Christ isn't that powerful? In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm the worst. Where are you at today? Have you sinned so much that you've disregarded the love of Jesus, the relentless love of Jesus? But here Paul the apostle says, I'm the worst of sinners and I'm the kind of person God came to save. In the book of Psalms 139 verse 14, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. So I'm not just accepted by Jesus. I'm celebrated by him and I can celebrate myself. I can say, Lord, what you have made is wonderful. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? I don't have to just tolerate myself. I can celebrate what God has done in me. And when that word is used fearfully and wonderfully made, it's speaking of he did it carefully. He thought through what he was doing, right? You're uniquely made. God designed you according to your purpose. When you're rejected in life, you end up with a twisted view of reality. You forget about your purpose. Remind yourself today that God designed you with a purpose. He said, what have I called Johnny to? What have I called Simpiwe to? What have I called Sipo to? Let me now fashion him according to that. Let me give him these gifts because he's going to need them for that particular purpose. Ephesians 1, 3 to 6. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. That's acceptance. That's acceptance. Colossians 1, 21 to 22. It says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. You see, the Bible describes Satan as the accuser of the brethren and he does it through people or even through your own thoughts where you begin to accuse yourself. When that happens, remind yourself that you've been accepted. I'm telling you now, this is the antidote for rejection. In John 6, 37, all those 
the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. People can drive you away. People can bully you at school. People can ostracize you. People can discriminate against you in the workplace. But Jesus says, whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. That's a promise. That's a promise. And it's important to embrace that. In Acts chapter 10, 34 to 35, opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. But in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Remember, Peter was going through that whole process where he had a vision of unclean foods and uh, God was preparing him to go to the Gentiles. And he had to deal with his own racism. He had to deal with his own issues. And it was when he met with Cornelius and Cornelius's, Cornelius's household, he realized that, you know what? God shows no partiality. God shows no partiality. He welcomes everyone from every nation. And I'm telling you right now, many of us have been affected by things like xenophobia. Some of you have been affected by tribalism. But I'm telling you, that is not in God's heart. You see, sometimes we're treated badly and we're ostracized by people. And when we now relate to God, we believe that we're the poor country cousin. You're not the poor country cousin. You're not the poor country cousin. So this is God's truth with with regards to our acceptance. But we live in a world full of rejection where we're continuously being rejected for for all sorts of things, for our mistakes, for how we speak, for our skin color. So it's so important to carry this emotional object constancy, the spiritual object constancy that says, I'm accepted by God, where you abide in his love. And when we do so, we can truly connect with each other in authentic community. Now, how does rejection affect the activation of authentic community. Why am I preaching this message? Why am I preaching this message? You see, I can give you tools for listening more effectively, for connecting, for uh, building rapport with people. But if you are bound by a spirit of rejection or a stronghold of rejection, you will have issues, you see. So all these things I'm talking about are flesh patterns that are not in line with God's truth. And it's so important to see that when behavior is based on false belief, the fruit is not good. Our action as a result of this um, identification is to actually confess, repent, and renounce these strongholds. You see, and often it's very subtle because the outward behavior is not always sinful. Okay, saying to someone, no, thanks, it's okay. You can go to that function. It's fine. You know, that's not necessarily sinful outwardly. People don't even notice it. But inwardly, if you're honest with yourself, you know, oh, I'm just rejecting myself before I can be rejected. Okay? So the heart motive behind our behavior is what's sinful. Sometimes we're dishonest with people, all right, because we're rejecting ourselves before we can be rejected. Now, remember this. You're not a victim. You're responsible for your behavior and for your attitude. And generally speaking, um, You have passive reactions to rejection, and then you have aggressive reactions to rejection. So rejection comes in many different guises. And I want to talk to you about some of these guises, right? And there are a number of them, and I want to address them because it's important to be able to talk about them, bring them to the light. And when you hear me talking about them, say to yourself, oh, yes, I think that there's there's a wound of rejection there, right? As you identify with it. Number one, constant feeling of abandonment, constant feeling of abandonment. And what does this look like? It could be fear of losing a loved one through death, where you're just bound by this fear that I'm going to be abandoned. I'm going to be abandoned. Right. And what tends to happen is you become controlling. Hey, phone me every half hour of your trip to tell me that you're okay and that nothing has happened to you. And you create this culture of fear in your family, but it's rooted in the fear of abandonment, fear of being cheated on, fear of rejection can also result in anger. And that's actually an aggressive way of dealing with rejection. So you put up a shield of anger as a defense mechanism, right? Often feeling misunderstood by people. People don't get me. People won't understand me. That's often rooted in rejection. Always explaining yourself 
because you feel misunderstood. You know those people who will keep looping, over explaining themselves, but at the root of it is the fear of being misunderstood. Okay. The second one is addictions and substance abuse. For example, alcohol, drugs, even food addiction. Right? So instead of running to the Prince of Peace, we practice idolatry. My question to you is, where do you run? Where do you run? So the mindset for many people is, the bottle won't reject me. Right? And you say to them, when do you find yourself going to the bottle and drinking? Oh, it's when I'm feeling lonely. Right? These are things that will affect authentic community. I've been coaching a particular individual uh, who had issues uh, just around alcohol abuse. And he's had such a breakthrough and he says, Paul, I no longer have to drink in order to have an authentic conversation with someone. All right. That was progress. Maybe masturbation and gambling. These are these are common outcomes of rejection. You see, and just remember when I mention these things, it's easy to judge others. But we must realize that pain can be so severe for people and very often pain seeks pleasure. The third one is unbelief, unbelief. When the people who were supposed to show us love didn't do so, then our tendency is to doubt the love of God and to transfer that unbelief onto the people around us. Oh, my dad promised X, Y, Z to me, but it never happened and I felt abandoned. So now when the pastor promises X, Y, Z, I doubt it and I'll always take it with a pinch of salt. That affects authentic community. You see, sometimes we can minister to others, but when it comes to ourselves, we sink into unbelief. When good things happen to us, we're suspicious. We think to ourselves, there must be a catch to this, right? In Hebrews 3, 12 to 13, it says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is still called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You see, sometimes we call our unbelief caution. We say, I'm mature now. I know people act like this and act like that. So let's just take everything with a pinch of salt. But what's actually happened is we've developed an evil heart of unbelief. Our heart has become hardened. We've been deceived. You see, often you feel very insignificant and inferior. When people try to show you otherwise, you still interpret your world through that lens. You often have strong thoughts of self-hatred. The isolated self is the bad self. Sometimes we see the different self as the bad self. Or I'm not like them, therefore I'm bad. There's nothing wrong with being different. And you see, very often, unbelief, it often comes in the form of a demonic spirit and you end up questioning God's heart for you. Be careful of unbelief. Be careful of unbelief. There are people around you that want to bless you. They want to be a blessing to you. Begin to believe. The Bible says love hopes all things. Love looks for the best in people. The fourth one is addictive relationships. You think you love that person. But it's more apt to say you need them. Your self-image is based on their acceptance or rejection of you. And this happens when people have experienced deep rejection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. God wants us to be free of all people free, where we do things out of love. The Bible says, my only obligation, our only obligation is to love one another. See, addictive relationships are characterized by emotional abuse and control. You end up controlling circumstances in your relationships. They're also characterized by codependency. What is codependency? The essence of it is you see it typically when you are too affected by someone else's emotional state. Okay, so everything I'm doing right now is to make sure that this person is happy. It's because I'm afraid that they might be unhappy. And when they're unhappy, I'm also unhappy. So let me try to control their emotional state so I feel better. All right, happens a lot. Now, uh, it also happens where you see collapsed boundaries. Be very careful. In addictive relationships, their boundaries are collapsed. You do not know where you end and where the other person begins. 
Now, as long as you have the root of rejection, you always be bent toward man and not straightened to God. Be careful of that. In John chapter 5, verse 41 to 44, it says, I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you receive them. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? I believe that believing in God means that he's our identity. We identify with him. He's the source of life. A common form of addictive relationships is joining a subculture or a cult just to feel like you belong. The fifth one is criticism and hypersensitivity. You exaggerate the probability of being rejected. You know those people, right? Small mistakes are seen as causes of abandonment. If I mess up here and make a mistake, I'll be fired. No, Paul, I can't challenge my boss on this. It's career limiting, right? You're debilitated in who you are as a person because of the fear of rejection. Everything you do is controlled by the fear of abandonment and rejection. You're offended or embarrassed when people correct you or when you're disciplined. Now in a family, there's discipline. Now how do you react when you're corrected? Just think about that. The sixth one, self-pity. Self-pity. You see your situation as all bad and you see other people as all good. And then you mope around feeling sorry for yourself. Be very careful of self-pity. Self-pity is one of those things, conditions, that actually opens ourselves up to demonic activity. Okay? Demons are attracted to it for various reasons. Number seven, performance mentality to maintain relationships. So there's love with the hook. I still remember an old friend of ours years ago would always give presents to people, draw out little cards for people. And on the surface, it looked like this person was really generous and kind. And they were. But I remember asking this individual, why do you keep doing so? And she said something interesting. She said, Paul, I feel like I have to always be doing favors for the people around me to maintain my relationship with them. So it's love with a hook. It's love with a hook. I'm doing something because of fear of abandonment. Right? And then you end up feeling so disappointed when love is not returned to you, when love is unrequited. You end up getting into debt-based relationships. They owe me one because I did this. They owe me affection. Sometimes you get into a mode of perfectionism and approval addiction as a result of this. It very often can even manifest in your parenting style and it produces this guilt because you want to be your kid's hero. You want to be celebrated by your children so, so much. And you forget that, wait a minute, I'm a parent. And sometimes I won't be popular with my kids because I have to discipline them. Have a look at Luke chapter 6, verse 34 to 36. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them, expecting nothing in return. Then your reward will be great, and you'll be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. I'm telling you right now, so often when we are driven by the spirit of rejection, we end up doing wonderful things that look good on the outside, but it's in order to gain acceptance or sometimes it's because of fear of their disapproval. We work hard for the relationship. The eighth one is self-sufficiency. Let me say something. Maturity is seen in interdependency, not in independence. And very often some people become so vehemently independent. You know, I won't receive anything from anyone. You can't do anything for me. Right? And we become very detached as people. Why? You know what? If I need you, you can drop me. 
You can reject me. You can let me down. So I'm only going to rely on just me. I don't trust anyone else. And so we isolate ourselves, which is the ninth point, isolation, hiding from love. You see, often the result is that we sabotage our relationships. When we get closer and closer to someone, we're uncomfortable with the intimacy, that emotional intimacy with that person. And on purpose, we will do something negative to push them away. Either we will just ignore them and we ghost them, or we will actually do something that we know they don't like. We sabotage the relationship so that they don't like us. We push them away because we're uncomfortable with intimacy. And this is often how the orphan spirit works. If you've worked with people who are homeless, you'll know that sometimes you start to work with them, you bring them in, you get close to them. And the moment you discipline that individual or have an altercation with them, boom, they've disappeared. It happens so much. And the result is that you end up with no mentors and your relationships with authority figures end up suffering. So we isolate ourselves both verbally and also physically. We distance ourselves from people. The tenth one is protesting behavior. You see, it's easier for you to attack than to express your needs in a vulnerable manner. You see, you can protest by rejecting others before they can reject you. And you see it happening. You know, you go to a meeting and someone is already attacking everyone because they're afraid of the rejection that will come from being attacked. You see a wife becoming very critical and nitpicky and pushing her husband away. But if she made herself vulnerable and expressed her real needs, she would actually be saying, honey, I miss you. Honey, I wish I could just have more couch time with you where we're not talking about the kids. We're not talking about admin. That's what divorced couples do. They'll talk admin. They'll talk about the kids. But honey, I just want to dream with you a bit. Can we do that? Okay. And it's more likely to come in and uh, do that because... Every man needs a beauty to rescue, but you have to be rescuable. The eleventh one is lies. Lies. Very often the spirit of rejection works hand in hand with lies. The lying spirit. You know, we start believing lies like, I will always be looking from the outside in. I'll never fit in with these people. These people are ashamed of me. You've got these inner villages, these inner voices within you right? That become these emotional triggers that are very loud, very loud. What lies are you believing? And how many lies have you believed that stem from the wound of rejection? The 12th one is attention-seeking behavior. Attention-seeking behavior. A lot of people who are bound by the spirit of rejection will do things just for attention. And it's so important to be able to identify that in your life. Are you overcompensating because you just want to be noticed? You see, some people who are bound by rejection, they've given up hoping for attention. So they withdraw. But many other people will fight for that attention. They'll fight for that acceptance. Instead of trusting God, they will overcompensate and perform attention-seeking behavior. The 13th one, comparisons, comparisons. This is where you're always looking over your shoulder. You're never feeling good enough. You feel like I have to always play catch up. I've seen it with people who are just maybe a few months apart from an older sibling. And the behavior they learned as they were growing up was, you know what, my older brother or my older sister, they are smarter than me. They can read quicker than me. They are stronger than me. And we don't realize that it's because they're older. So this behavior pattern comes through in our lives. And now we're in the workplace and we're like, how come everyone is always a step ahead? And we're continuously comparing. I never feel good enough. I always feel like I'm playing catch up. I see that childhood formation transferring into adulthood for so many people. The 14th one is the hero syndrome. If I achieve greatness, then I'll be accepted. The sad thing is that it's never enough. So you become this wonderful professional. You achieve all sorts of things. You're head boy, head girl. And you think that will make people like me. But you know what? It's never enough. You're always pursuing uh, even better. Let me make more money. Then I'll be accepted. But there's always this God-sized hole in you that only the love of Jesus, the relentless love of Jesus can fill up. That's the hero syndrome, and many people are bound by it. And you find them giving up at some point. 
you know what? I was pursuing all of these things, but I realized no one actually cares, <laughs> right? You know, sometimes um, the family relies on that hero for their comp corporate self-image, you know? So all eyes are new to achieve. Because people around you are always talking about it and praising you. Oh, did you see what he accomplished? Did you see he did this and this and this? Now, there's dysfunction in the family. There's dysfunction in the community. But people are celebrating you, right? And so you have to live up to that image. Let me say something to you to bring freedom. It's okay to be weak. You don't have to be perfect to be accepted. Think about it. The people you like the most, are they the heroes? Are they the people who are most perfect? Are they the best looking? No. So why do you think people will like me more and accept me and include me because of all my heroism and all my heroic accomplishments? You know, sometimes people will actually use you for their own self-image. They'll invite you to a function because their function looks better because you are there, but they don't love you for who you are. The 15th one is permissive and placating behavior in your relationships. So it can be seen in your management style where you, you don't reprimand your people because you don't want to look like the ugly monster, right? You see it in your parenting style. You want to be liked and you want to be popular with your kids. So you end up very placating. What do I mean by placating? Someone does something bad, but you're like, no, it's okay. It's fine. It's okay. You know, it happens to all of us when you should actually be reprimanding the person. Okay, you project your fear of rejection onto others around you, right? You don't discipline others because of fear of being misunderstood and ultimately being rejected by them. It's amazing. You say to people, why didn't you give them that feedback? I don't want them to just seem, I don't want to hurt them. Paul, I don't want to hurt them. Is it because you don't want to hurt them or is it something else? To be honest with you, Paul, I don't want them to think I'm nasty. Why? Because they might reject me and they might misunderstand me. And they might treat me like I'm the big ugly monster. Okay? Your fear of rejection, even by your own kids. Sometimes you can feel so rejected by your own kids. You go to school functions and they don't understand around you. You go and you try and connect with their friends and they're like, oh, that looks weird. Please, dad, go and talk to other parents. Don't try and connect too much with my friends. It's a bit too much. You can feel rejected by your own children. The 16th one, self-rejection, self-rejection. You know that suicide is an extreme form of self-rejection, right? It's a very extreme form of dealing with your pain. So you reject yourself. I don't accept this person that I've become, so let me eliminate this person. Often the depression and the despair has become so strong that a spirit of death attaches itself to someone. It started off as a spirit of rejection. But after a while, the spirit of death comes along and you begin to believe all sorts of lies and you start to think yourself, to yourself, it's better I just disappear from here. You know that fantasy is a form of self-rejection. Let me imagine I was someone else. Let me imagine I had a different life. Let me imagine I'm not who I actually am. You see, part of self-acceptance, which I'll speak on next time, is actually embracing all parts of yourself as this is part of me, instead of being detached with some of the parts of you. Often healing from rejection involves correcting a misplaced identity. So just reflect on these and ask yourself, to identify with any of these, and maybe there's a root of rejection that's there. It's important for us to deal with that so that we can have authentic community. In the book of Psalms 68, verse 5 through to 7, it says, A father of the fatherless and a judge for the widows is God in his holy habitation. God makes a home for the lonely. He leads out the prisoners into prosperity. Only the rebellious dwell in a parched land. Your current condition doesn't have to stay like that. I often say to people, whatever you're going through, it's fixable. It's fixable. If your father has not been present for you, God is your father. And God is a voice for the voiceless. 
In the book of Psalms 68 verse 6 in the ESV, it says, God settles the solitary in a home. Some translations say the lonely in a home. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. You see, God has a solution for rejection. And very often healing takes place in community. Your situation does not need to remain the same. And it's so important to deal with rejection issues so that we don't pass on rejection to our own children or to the people who are in our care. You know, despite everything that you've been through, remember the scriptures. Colossians 2, 9 to 10. For in him, that's Jesus, the fullness of God continues to live giving complete expression of his divine nature. And you are in him and you have come to fullness of life. In Christ, you too are filled with the fullness of God and reach full spiritual stature. In Christ Jesus is where we have this wonderful freedom. And I want you to just embrace this process. And I wanna pray for you that God completely liberates you from the spirit of rejection in order for you to enter into authentic community. Father, I thank you for the people of God. I thank you, God, for the healing that you are bringing to us. I thank you, Father God, that where there have been wounds of rejection, you are bringing a supernatural healing and that you are showing us that we can abide in your love, we can abide in your acceptance. And Father, even as the enemy is being exposed, right now for the wounding that has taken place in our lives. Let these wounds, Lord, be replaced by self-acceptance. Help us on this journey, Lord, as we embrace acceptance from you, affirmation from you, validation from you, and as we walk in complete freedom. Father, we repent of the fleshly patterns that we've embraced, the strongholds that we've been embraced in our minds, the lies that we've believed, Lord, that have kept us isolated. Father, we recognize that hurt people hurt others. And as we've been stung by rejection, very often we've hurt other people. We ask for your forgiveness and for your cleansing. And we thank you, Lord, as we open our heart in this journey of freedom. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Next time, I'm going to speak to you on self-acceptance and the power of self-acceptance. And I'm going to take you through some steps for the healing from the spirit of rejection and the wound of rejection. And then afterwards, we'll start talking about how we can actually accept other people and include other people and be part of the solution in our authentic communities. God bless you.